Well, uh, friends, it's so wonderful to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture, the Sir, Hib not Sir Donald Hibbard Lecture. My name's Ian Harper, and I'm the Dean of Melbourne Business School. Uh, I'm delighted to co-host this evening's webinar with uh, my colleague, our internal Dean, Karan Beaton-Wells. Uh, Karan, it's great to be here with you this evening, and I hand over to you. Thank you, Ian, and good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us online for such an exciting discussion on leadership, the topic of the moment and the day. But to begin with, Ian and I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, traditional custodians of the land on which our school's Carlton Melbourne buildings stand. We also acknowledge traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. We celebrate their culture and their connections to land and sea and community. And we very much pay our deepest respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Well, just to set a little context around this evening's event, this lecture, as you know, is part of the Sir Donald Hibbert Lectureship in honour of the Sir Donald Hibbert, one of Australia's great nation builders. This lectureship was established by the late Lady Florence Hibbert with support from the University of Melbourne and Camelco in memory of her dear husband. And we're extremely grateful, we're honoured that the school has had the opportunity to present this annual lecture for many years now, and in so doing, fulfill our mission to transform lives through education. On that note, I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to two very special guests, guests joining us online tonight, Professor Adrian Hibbert and Dr. Christine Penfold, the son and the daughter of Sir Donald and Lady Florence. A very warm welcome to you both, Adrian and Christine. Ian, I'm going to pass back to you now, if you would run us through some housekeeping for this evening's lecture. Well, thanks, Karan, and uh, my warm welcome to you too, Adrian and Christine. Lovely to have you again with us for this lecture. Uh, well, this evening, friends, we're privileged to hear from one of our own uh, in this very important and, as Karan says, timely area of leadership, Professor Amanda Sinclair, uh, my colleague and friend. Um, but before I hand over to Amanda, I'd like to run through some important housekeeping details for our session this evening. So Amanda's presentation will, will run for around about the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, but uh, characteristically of Amanda, uh, she has some different elements that she's going to add in. So you can expect a couple of interactive elements, uh, including at least one poll, uh, which I would encourage you to engage with in the spirit of Amanda's uh, presentation. Now on the way through, you may well have questions and you'll see as per usual, you're used to the Zoom arrangements now, there's a Q&A box uh, at the bottom there. And I'd invite you to uh, put any questions that you have in there and you can upgrade other people's questions in the usual way. We hope to have some time towards the end of the session where uh, I'll pick out the most popular questions that have risen to the top there and put those to Amanda on your behalf, uh, but inevitably, given the number of people involved, not everyone will have a question answered that they'd like to have answered. And Amanda has very graciously agreed to respond to some of the most popular ones that she doesn't get a chance to answer uh, by putting those answers up in a written form on our website, along with a recording of this evening's lecture over the next couple of days. So uh, please don't feel as though you've missed out uh, if by chance your question doesn't get asked. Uh, at the conclusion of the formal proceedings, we'd like to invite you to stay online just for four or five minutes uh, as Amanda takes us through a meditation session just to lead us into the rest of our evening. Uh, that's um, something which Amanda's been very well known for now at the school, and I'd commend that opportunity to you too. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great, great pleasure to now hand over the reins to our 2021 Sir Donald Hibbert lecturer, my colleague and friend, Professor Amanda Sinclair. Amanda. Thank you very much, Ian and Karan. And uh, thank you everyone for zooming in from all over the place. I, I've been really moved by the response to this lecture. You know, the topic is timely. But it's, it feels very precious, doesn't it, to be able to pause, to take some time to reflect, to come together, 
and to support each other in this time of, of so much global uncertainty and turmoil. It feels very precious opportunity uh, for me, certainly. So thank you all for joining us uh, from, around, from around the place. And if you'd like to, please do put in the chat box where you're coming from, where you're Zooming from. Um, and if you know the Indigenous country name of the place where you're living and working right now, please do include that. So with that, I'd also like to acknowledge the Boonarung people who are the people who have um, cared for this land on which I've li I'm living and working at, at present. I have learnt so much over the years from our First Nations leaders, and I believe that they offer us so much guidance to how to care for country, how to care for culture, and also how to take a transgenerational perspective. So I thank them for all of their leadership over millennia, really, as part of opening our proceedings tonight. I'd also like to uh, just briefly thank the MBS team that have supported, uh, supported us in bringing this event to you tonight. So Danielle, Joe, Andrew, and the rest of the team, thank you very much. Can I also extend my welcome and thanks to Adrian and Christine? Um, I had a delightful conversation about uh, Sir Donald Hibbard and Lady Hibbard uh, with Adrian and Christine as part of preparing for this session. And I realized that there were some many sort of connections between myself and, and certainly I met Lady Hibbard uh, in the early days when I joined the business school. So Lady Hibbard decided to um, create a, a legacy to her husband's contribution quite soon after his uh, premature and untimely death. And she initially approached the University of Melbourne uh, the Chancellor and also the uh, Vice-Chancellor at the time, with thoughts of bestowing a, a lectureship in medicine. But the Chancellor, who was Sir Roy or Pansy Wright, he was known as Pansy Wright, sort of sat her down and said, well, look, what, why not, you know, we've got this new school of business. Why not think about Sir Donald's legacy was very much in the area of business and why not uh, set it up in um, the Graduate School of Management as it was then, which became the Melbourne Business School, uh, which was uh, what she did. And uh, John Rose, who was the inaugural dean of the school at that time, who also hired me uh, and was a great mentor to me. Um, John and I didn't always see eye to eye on everything. He, he was an economist after all. Um, but he was a great mentor to me. And um, it was very, very fascinating that it was actually Pansy Wright who bestowed my PhD uh, at Wilson Hall some years before that. And we'd had a lovely conversation up on the dais at Wilson Hall about, uh, about the matters of my findings in my PhD. And then to come to the business school and have the opportunity on a number of occasions to chat with Lady Hibbert over over lunch and to hear her amazing appetite for education and the impact that education would have. So it was, um, it was a delight to accept this, this honor tonight. And you may notice that I have subtitled the lecture, A Time for Humility, for Learning and for Giving Back. And those things really resonate with my understanding of Sir Donald's life and his legacy certainly from humble beginnings, but and in spite of an outstanding senior career, always a, a huge commitment to giving back to the uh, constituencies and the people that he worked with and supported. And the same was true for Lady Hibbard. So it is a time of, for humility, isn't it? Um, last 18 months, if I think about that, it's been a, a time for us all to, to uh, learn to adapt Certainly, if I'm really frank with you up front, you know, I spent the first few months of 2020 in a state of somewhat denial. I felt confident that I'd be back teaching in the room with, uh, in the way that I love to do with my students, uh, but then started to realize that I need to reach out and, and learn. Um, and I reached out to a couple of my MBS colleagues. I want to particularly acknowledge Jody Evans and Dashani Ganagoda here 
who was just so generous, invited me into the classes, talked about how to, to make this whole online teaching thing work. And in spite of my own um, doubts and um, feelings that I was just a complete technophobe and I'd, I'd stuff it up, uh, it, it actually went okay. Um, I had a sign above my desk saying, you can do it. And, um, you know, that supported me and, and others supported me to make that work. So I'd like to talk about three particular lessons today. I'd like to share three particular lessons with you that I think leaders need to be taking from lockdown. The first of those lessons is that work and work practices have changed irrevocably forever. And what this means, of course, is that leaders need to change too. The leadership task has fundamentally changed, I believe. And it, it's critical for us to, to change in positive ways, to embrace this opportunity in spite of all the difficulties. The second lesson, I believe, is that we need to look in, in new and different places for inspiration for leadership. And as a very keen leader watcher myself, I've seen you know, some examples of pretty poor leadership and, and some examples of what I regard as brilliant leadership. Uh, through the late last 18 months uh, of the, the COVID difficulties and the, and the lockdowns. And the third lesson that I'd like to uh, just explore with you, I believe that we, we need to be in this moment. You know, this, this one here, this, this Tuesday night with this group of people coming together to reflect to pause, uh, to think about how to lead in new ways going forward. I believe that a focus on always looking to the future, you know, hoping that happiness that uh, that's at some point in the future will, will come back to a, a more normal state. Uh, I, th I think it's not right for the times. I think we need to really stop and pause and appreciate uh, the privilege, the opportunities, uh, the beauty, the importance of caring for one another right now. So, Joe, can I ask you to share, uh, start sharing the following slides? Thanks, Joe. So, with this slide, I, I just wanted to capture, uh, you know, a big shift really around leadership. And of course, on the left, you know, we can see uh, Scott Morrison, our Australian Prime Minister, and uh, Greg Hunt, Brendan Murphy looking exceedingly glum alongside him. Um, you know, there's all of the trappings of traditional leadership. There's the lectins, there's the flags, there's the suits. Um, this, is, this is sort of leadership at how we knew it. Um, but then on the right hand side, we've got Jacinda Ardern and I, you know, I make no secret of the fact that I'm a, a, a big fan and I started watching Jacinda, uh, you know, many years ago before she was elected. And here she is, she's sitting on her uh, lounge room floor. She's got a windsheeter on, you know, it's the end of the day. And she's actually doing sort of Facebook calls and responses to questions. So not only, you know, is she inviting people to dial in and put questions to her, they are completely unscripted. Her responses are completely unscripted. She's keeping people updated. And this photo was taken, um, in the middle of the New Zealand lockdown uh, last year. So a very, very different uh, approach to how to lead through crisis. So we know, uh, well, le we in the leadership field say you should never waste a good crisis. And of course, this hasn't been a good crisis. You know, it, it's been really, really difficult uh, at, at, at many levels. But there is a kernel of truth in that notion that that, that crises give us opportunities to, to tackle new things, to, to find new adaptions and ways of doing things. And so I might move to the next slide, thanks Joe, which just starts to summarise the next few slides, we'll start to summarise some of the changes that we've seen, both good and bad as a result of this crisis. We're working longer hours, there's no doubt about that, and at, at least 15% more, you know, for many of us more than that, and it has to do with the collapsing of the boundaries. There's, there were, you know, often few boundaries between home and work, but they've, they've, they've really, you know, just gone out the window now. But in spite of that, most of us are really enjoying the flexibility with how and where we work. Most of us want to continue to have some say in that and want to continue to have a 
some choice and flexibility around that. Our productivity uh, is holding up well. People are really doing a great job. And also uh, power distance. You know, we really like seeing our leaders in, in their lounge rooms, you know, in their spare bedrooms. We like seeing them without all of the trappings of, of hierarchy and leadership. We're really warming to that. Next slide, thanks Joe. People are re-evaluating jobs, our work they do and how work fits into lives. You know, you will have seen the massive move and we've seen it among our MBS colleagues. There's a, a, a lot who are really re-evaluating where they live and how they do their work. And it's, a, it's an unexpected bonus of, of the, the situation. At least 50% of us uh, and more women are considering making a change in our careers towards a different kind of work, towards work that feels more purposeful and meaningful to us. Next slide, thanks Jo. Yet, uh, in spite of some of those good trends, we are seeing very, very differential impacts on uh, different sectors through lockdowns. A disproportionate effect um, on women um, around, who are carrying around 70% of the burden of homeschooling. We've seen lost jobs, of course, in hospitality and in all sorts of fields. Um, experiencing high degrees of burnout and exhaustion. Mental health calls for assistance have increased dramatically with loneliness, anxiety and suicidal ideation peaking for online providers, though not interestingly uh, service num suicide numbers. And I just want to uh, point to um, this area, this sector of mental health provision as an area that's just seen some extraordinary adaption. And a shout out to my friends and colleagues in um, Beyond Blue. It's just been extraordinary to watch the way in which health providers and mental health providers have responded to these increasing demands and the need for access from all parts of the country for mental health services. I've just been in awe of the adaption and ingenuity in that sector. Next slide, thank you, Joe. Uh, we've also seen spikes in family violence. And in fact, there was a new report released yesterday, a New South Wales report uh, that confirmed what earlier reports have been telling us. Uh, that is that the move to homes is often the move to stay home is often a very unsafe move, move for many in our communities. Uh, we've seen uh, statistics of uh, people accessing emergency housing and needing support from uh, domestic violence services. Uh, we've seen lots of new people accessing those services. And we've also seen the people who are accessing those services suffering increasing levels of all sorts of uh, violence and coercive control. And of course, we've also seen socioeconomic and multicultural inequalities really exacerbated. Uh, and aged care, of course, is one of the most obvious examples of that. We're, we're, we're realising that some of these jobs are just undoable. They're so precarious and they require people to be doing multiple jobs. And so we really need to pay attention to some of those inequalities that the crisis is revealing to us. And the next slide, thank you. So we've seen some fantastic adaptions. I've just talked about in, in pro the provision of mental health services, but there has been a remarkable shift to digital. Uh, you know, we, we've all seen it. And it's, it's been in areas where we've thought that face-to-face -face was essential. So I've done work with um, courtrooms uh, and, and it's been amazing to see the way in which uh, so many courtrooms have moved to digital and in some ways uh, improved their effectiveness uh, as part of that process. We've seen organisations dropping the mandate to be physically in the office, pioneering a digital first philosophy. And that whole approach that it is client needs and employee dis discretion that drives where you do the work rather than having a manager tell you you need to do it in the office. We've seen uh, a lot of surprising evidence and this did surprise me. As I said earlier, I was a bit of a skeptic. Uh, I thought that it would be hard to create belonging and intimacy 
and connection in an online classroom. But I think in some cases we've done it better. So one of the things that's really impressed me is that uh, as a teacher, we are all just a tile on a, on a Zoom screen. And what that does in many cases is it kind of democratizes uh, the contribution. You know, sometimes what it has done in my experience is mean that the quieter members of classes have spoken up, have felt confident and secure and safe in their environment uh, to speak up. Uh, it's enabled those living in a remote and regional places to participate. I know in my class last year, I had people beaming into my class from Germany, uh, from Sweden, from Singapore, uh, from South America. And how good was that? I mean, it just added uh, such a level of um, diversity to the classroom and a diversity of experience. And all sorts of innovations in organisational culture. We know that we must refocus on values and purpose as the things that connect us uh, to our work sites uh, and to our workplaces and to our colleagues rather than the physical location. There's also of course been the collapse of the traditional expatriate model which has been very fascinating to watch and perhaps it should have it should be collapsing. I mean you know that it doesn't make sense to have that level of global travel. It doesn't make environmental sense. So we've seen new ways of operating globally and new comfort with technology, which is all uh, a very refreshing innovation. So next slide, thanks, Joe. Uh, but workplaces need to change even more. You know, uh, if, we, if we look at them, we need to experiment with fewer hours, different ways of, of doing the work. We know that grueling hours in the office and long commutes associated with long commutes are really bad for us. They're bad for our health and our mental health. And the next one, thank you. We also know that some of those office norms that have arisen out of that, you know, norms around presenteeism and having to be in the office for having to travel very, very uh, a great deal, have been a deterrent to diversity, certainly a diversity at, at the topmost rank self of organisations. So finding more flexibility in this is definitely going to entice more women and more diverse employees into senior levels of leadership. So workplaces need to be sites for purposeful occupation, not exploitation. They need to be places for friendship, for meaningful, creative, collaborative work, rather than stressing incubators. But what's it all mean for leadership? Let's move to the next one, thanks, thanks, Joe. It really does mean a change in the leadership task. And the next one, thank you. So down the left-hand side of that particular slide, you can see that um, there's a whole lot of new pressures that are accruing on leaders. And, you know, I, I work with lots, I hear some of these pressures. So much emotion, uh, so much uncertainty. And a lot of that accrues at leaders. Uh, you know, people lo are looking to leaders for their demeanor, for guidance, for how to operate in this new and different world. We know from research that often in crises, leaders tend to kind of centralize control. They tend to pull things in. They tend to revert to using uh, the overt levers of organizational life to get change. But we also know that many of those things are very unsuited to this kind of crisis that we're facing now, where actually leaders need to increase their scanning. They need to increase their different levels of, uh, and ways that they work out what is happening in their communities. So down the right-hand side, you'll see a list of some of the responses that uh, we're encouraging leaders to uh, develop as part of their response a lot more openness around emotion and a capacity to both acknowledge our own emotions and to help others regulate their emotions. We need to be modeling self-compassion and compassion. We need to be helping people um, get perspective to you know, discourage rumination, uh, to, to notice if we're catastrophizing unnecessarily, to encourage people to be in the moment, to see the good things that are in the moment. We need to be building cultures of care. 
And, you know, depending on your context uh, and, and the groups that you work in, this will take a different shape. But it, it undoubtedly will mean extra check-ins, extra oppression, expressions of appreciation, of trust, giving permission to people to sign off, to tune out, um, to close the laptop are all part of that. And lastly, and, and to some degree most importantly, I think it often requires for many of us a shift in professional identity. So, so, so many leaders see themselves as problem solvers, as fixers, um, as, as doers. And what this crisis has shown, I think, that, is that for many of us, our roles have really shifted to being much more heavily uh, focused on providing pastoral care. And it involves this sort of rethinking our capabilities as part of that you know, from a, perhaps a traditional notion of who we are and where we added value to a purpose of supporting others. So next slide, thanks, Joe. Just summing up then, what, what are some of the, 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 the way we can, as leaders, sort of step up to reimagine and, and recreate workplaces? Listen and learn, be open and vulnerable about your own experiences. Ask others what they need and expect differences in their response. Give agency and choice where feasible. You know, no one size fits all. Move over. You know, give power to the next generation. Trust that people can be just as effective as one person said to me with a toddler on my knee. Next slide, thank you. But also recognise that as we move into some kind of new equilibrium, and it's going to take us a while to find uh, that equilibrium, there will be uh, increasing inequalities. Ensure that those who are able to kind of revert or come back into the office in more customary and familiar ways don't get valued more, that we keep on working on this process of adaption and innovation. And do all of the above because it's the right thing to do to care about others it is you know it is what we're here for as humans it's not just because it will likely boost engagement and productivity and also look in new places for leadership but before we do that i'd like to invite and i've been seeing lots of wonderful responses to our uh, chat about uh, from where you're coming and lovely to welcome you from all of those parts of uh, all over the place. I'm going to invite um, <clears throat> Danielle to put up a poll <clears throat> and in this poll what we'd like you to do is register you know what one characteristic you'd like to see in leadership and see more of in leadership over the as we go forward. So if you'd like to just register which of those qualities are coming up on your screen, that would be great. We'll give you a few more seconds, seeing which, which ones are very important for you. Fantastic. I'm going to ask uh, Karan to jump in in a moment and just, uh, I think we're probably, yeah, we're probably at a stage where we can stop that and share results. Thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Okay, so authenticity is a really strong uh, one coming through, so 41%. But also very nice to see this spread of different uh, things that you're, you're valuing. Humility uh, is second, I think, is it? Mm -hmm. Interesting, Amanda, that humility vote is very consistent with the, some of the themes you were touching on and the importance of leaders not trying to, let alone pretending to have all the answers and being prepared to accede to the uncertainty and ambiguity of the moment that we're all in and um, there being no clarity really for anyone as to what <laughs> the answers are. It's, it's, it's absolutely right and, uh, you know, I was saying that as a as a leader watcher, I've been uh, I've been watching a lot of leaders, and 
Look, you know, leaders who are prepared to show that uh, vulnerability, uh, I, I think, have come across so powerfully in, in so many contexts. Um, <clears throat> That's right. And authenticity, I mean, another word I think many of us can relate to in that regard is just realness. It's yeah. the wholeness of the person that, yeah. rather than the persona that gets yes. presented. Well, thank you, everyone, for that. I, I think it really provides a template for us, doesn't it, in terms of going forward um, and, and some guidance on what people are looking for from us as well. So I'd like to move on to my next um, lesson, which is let's, let's start looking in some surprising places, some new and different places for leadership inspiration. And um, I might go to the next... Uh, slide as part of doing that. Thank you, Joe. So um, here we have two chief, uh, chief health officers who'd be very familiar to all of us in Australia right now. Uh, Jeanette Young, uh, Dr. Jeanette Young from Queensland and uh, Kerry Chant, Dr. Jer Kerry Chant from New South Wales. And look, I, I think that they've just been quite remarkable, both of them, day in, day out, uh, providing sort of clear, persistent, uh, reliable, thoughtful advice, you know, and in spite of the ups and downs, and of course, Kerry Chance coming under a lot of pressure, they've both come under a lot of scrutiny and visibility for their reactions and responses. Uh, and in particular, Jeanette Young for showing some emotion, also Kerry Chant at another uh, time for showing some emotion. And I, I, I wanted to make the point about that, that to think that leaders should park their emotion or put away their emotion is a really limited old style fallacy in leadership. You know, of course, leaders can't, you know, be completely victim to their, their feelings. But if you're not able to be moved by a situation and to convey that uh, and to be in touch with your own emotions, it's very unlikely you'll be able to show leadership. And I think both of these uh, individuals in in quite different ways have been able to provide such amazing leadership. I would certainly follow Jeanette Young just about anywhere, I think. So next one, Joe. So uh, this is a, a slide of two leaders that I put up at the start of my leadership and change class. And on the left-hand side, you'll see Greta Thunberg, you know, uh, leader of a huge environmental movement. And on the right-hand side, that's Mick, uh, Mike Cannon-Brooks, co-founder of Atlassian. And one of the things that I do as part of you know, my opening classes is ask the students, well, where do you see leadership and why in these two uh, individuals? And it's pretty interesting, the conversation that follows almost inevitably. You know, I ask the students to watch a couple of videos actually, and, and in, uh, one of those videos, uh, Greta is actually ad addressing the United Nations and, and, and she's pretty emotional. You know, she's pretty impactful with her message. And the initial response among, uh, you know, some of the students is to really quite, you know, dismiss, uh, dismiss her. Uh, and and uh, it's very interesting to watch. Most people talk about Mike Cannon books initially and of course, you know, I, I don't want to uh, in any way minimise his leadership. He's been an amazing uh, leader, corporate leader of Atlassian, but also much more broadly done a whole lot of very interesting things uh, on the environmental side. But it, it's, it's very interesting uh, to watch how, as we explore these themes and explore what we want our leaders to do and for what we want them to stand, that the people start to open up their ideas about what leadership looks like. Yeah, and they start to see leadership in more diverse places, which I admit is one of the reasons that I'm, I'm so interested in, in, this, uh, in this issue. We want leaders who ask, who and what is my leadership for? You know, we want uh, that in our leaders and uh, we want to expand that kind of thinking uh, among the students, I certainly believe. It does have a great effect. So one of the things that often happens in my class, I ask them to go and interview a leader. And initially, many of them think, oh, well, I'll go and ask, you know, I'll interview my boss or my CEO. 
and some of those bosses and CEOs are very deserving of an interview. But by sort of about the middle of the cl class, you know, many of them are also going out to interview leaders of uh, refugee um, refugee organisations or leaders in community. So there's that sense in which we really are looking for our leaders to to stand for something, to stand for important purposes. Our next slide, thanks, Joe. So this is Chanel Contos. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Chanel, and look, I love uh, offering her as an example. She is actually studying a master's in London, and she, she initiated the Teach for Consent movement that some of you may uh, know of. And this was really just a, a petition initially to, to lobby for school students to be taught what consent was in sexual matters. And it gathered extraordinary momentum uh, as part of her efforts. It was, um, and, and uh, it was just such a fabulous example of a young person really gathering some um, momentum around this issue of, you know, young people really not understanding what sexual consent looks like. And Chanel, along with others, of course, you know, began then working with, you know, school principals and again when they often responded in ways that uh, tended to you know tell the tell the girls that they needed to be careful about what they drink or what they wore you know push back against that view and demanded a, a, a different view so a really really um impressive uh act, act of or set of acts of leadership in my view and the next one thanks and another person uh, so, of course, this is Grace Tame, the Australian of the Year. And if I think about uh, speaking out and courage, uh, Grace Tame would have to be a, a fantastic exemplar. You know, we've seen many examples uh, before and after she became Australian of the Year of, of her speaking out in, a, in the space where Chanel Contos was also working around what constitute cons constitutes consent around sexual abuse and exploitation. And of course, she herself was a victim of that as a, as a young woman. If I think about speaking truth to power, here is, a, here is a great example. And of course, we need, we need young people, we need people to be, uh, to be capable of these sorts of acts of speaking out and courage. And the next slide, thanks. So on this slide, uh, I have a series of First Nations leaders. And as I said in my opening, I've learned a great deal uh, from my work with Indigenous leaders and from, from listening to, from observing Indigenous leaders. They have a great deal to teach us. On the left-hand side, uh, Pat Turner, who some of you will have seen in the news recently, she has been the convener of the organization, the PEAKS organization, which has successfully negotiated with the federal government a whole series of reforms aimed at closing the, back, the gap with indigenous, for our First Nations peoples, uh, but particularly around securing financial compensation and reparation for uh, victims of the stolen generation. So an extraordinary, act of a very, very long haul leadership uh, among some of those leaders that we've seen. I've also got there Dean Parkin, um, another young leader who's been doing some incredible work gathering support for uh, around constitutional recognition uh, for First Nations people and recognition of the Uluru Statement of the Heart and having that embedded in the Constitution in meaningful ways, recognised in the Constitution in meaningful ways. And, and two more there that I've included because I've been so also so impressed, uh, April Day and Paul Silver, who've both been young people affected by Aboriginal deaths in custody and who've who've kind of stepped forward out of out of trauma and difficulty and and 
lobbied for change, advocated for change under the most extraordinarily difficult circumstances. I think we have, again, a great deal to learn from them. I, I read that Paul Silver, he, he was quoted as saying in an article that he, he's not a natural, he's not a public speaker, you know, nothing in his life had equipped him for, for this. And, uh, you know, after a while, he, he started speaking at quite small events and then, you know, found himself addressing very large events on this issue. And what, what helped him was the sense of his, his uncle kind of speaking through him and giving him the courage and the convictions to stand up for these important issues. And so uh, I think they've both been incredibly inspirational in that sense. And next slide, thank you. So uh, turning to sport now, and, and you know, we've, of course, we've got to move to sport having just uh, closed the Olympics. And I wanted to include um, <clears throat> Ash Barty here, of course. And this is a picture of her at Wimbledon. And I think she's a model, isn't she, of, of graceful uh, leadership with such grace, um, you know, a model for us all to follow. And I, I love this photo because instead of kind of punching the air and roaring at the audience when she wins, she claps her racket. And it, it, it feels to me like a way of clapping for the game, clapping for the audience, clapping for her opponent, clapping for the whole uh, enterprise rather than just for her individual efforts. So an extraordinary example of a leader, uh, as well as you know that, that recognition of her debt to her mentor, Yvonne Gorgon. I, uh, she's, she's an amazing leader. And the last one that I wanted to just share with you, this is the Matildas. And that's um, Sam Kerr in the front left-hand corner with a, a hand around her, her head. And looks, I didn't win the medal, but this is leadership as team, is it not? Uh, every time I've seen uh, Sam interviewed, it, it is all about the team. It is not the individual effort. It is all about the team. So we'd like you now to um, take a moment to think about leaders that have inspired you over the last 18 months. They might be from any walk of, uh, any walk of life. We'd like you to put them in the chat, um, their names, and perhaps just a word or two about why they've inspired you. And again, we'll wait for a moment uh, while you, you do that, and then I'll invite Karan uh, to have a bit of a chat with me about who you've nominated. Yes, Brittany Higgins, indeed. <laughs> I've got to confess, Amanda, you stole my thunder because when I saw this question, I had Jacinda top of my list. Yes, Jacinda. Uh, Paddy better. Mills, uh, that's, he's absolutely brilliant, indeed. The boomer. There you go, anyone can be a leader, from David. Yes. Yes, Sharon Lewin from the Doherty. Indeed, some of our epidemiologists have been so extraordinary, haven't they? Julian Triggs, yes. Ruby Tui, fantastic. Dan Merkel. Andrews. And Angela Merkel, too, of course, and just stepping down. Miriam Rose Ungermeyer. They're yeah. fantastic suggestions. Malala Yousaf. Am I missing? Uh, not <laughs> they're, they're coming thick and fast, aren't they? they but, are fantastic. <laughs> but interesting to see how many of our, you know, chief medical officers being recognised. They're people who wouldn't traditionally have been thrust into the spotlight in the way they have. Yes. At least into yes. the political fray. Yes. So fantastic. I think we'll bring that to a close. But thank you all for. Um, for those suggestions, uh, <laughs> I, I'm finding it hard to stop watching. Um, <laughs> it's, it's mesmerizing, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, just coming to uh, the last point that I wanted to finish with, the last of the three lessons that I wanted to share, and there's Kamala Harris, yes, of course, there's another one, um, with you. And that is the point about um, <clears throat> the lesson that it's, it's not necessarily a great idea to put our hopes and everything in the future. And, and this lesson has been an important part of my journey around mindfulness and, and as a meditation teacher. 
You know, it's slightly heretical for somebody in a business school to say, look, I'm not really into goals. I'm not really into targets. And, you know, I think what COVID has shown us to some degree is that they are, you know, it's very hard to have goals and targets at the moment. There is so much uncertainty. And so to pin our hopes on reaching certain targets and to think that after that, life will be beautiful, life will be sweet, I think is, is kind of often encouraging the wrong, the wrong mentality for us. So I'd really like to encourage this idea that, that we pause and we notice how, how much there is to be thankful for right now you know, even in lockdown. And sometimes because of lockdown, uh, I mean, it has slowed a lot of us down. It has uh, enabled us to, to do some things differently, to, to spend more time um, with pets. Or, uh, it, it's, it's opened some doors for us and I, I want to suggest that that's an important thing. I noticed that the uh, Olympic Committee uh, for the most recent games decided not to go for setting a whole lot of goals of uh, how many gold they wanted, how many silver and how many bronze. And their, and their argument was that the athletes didn't need more pressure. You know, they all already need, or they already put so much pressure on themselves that it's actually far better to really just encourage them and support them to, uh, to relax and to enjoy the uh, you know, the stellar performances that we saw. And I know that Ash Barty's coach, similarly, the, the mind coach, was similarly uh, focused not on the future, not on the goal, not on what others are expecting, but on the moment, on being built really fully in the moment. So if I might uh, get Joe to share that, uh, the last slide. So this is a picture of our front fence. Um, this was at, this photo was taken in, um, I think it was lockdown four, it was June, I think, and uh, it was winter, it was cold, it was hard to be cheerful about anything. Um, but our lemon tree was just bursting with lemons. And so, you know, we picked some lemons and we put them out on the front fence and it had the most miraculous effect. It, it, it was emptied every day, so we kept filling it every day. But people would call out and thank us. And, you know, if we happened to be sitting on the, on the front veranda, as we often did trying to get some winter sun, you know, there'd be a conversation. People would say, well, I'm going to make some lemon delic delicious or, uh, you know, they'd tell us what they were going to do with them. It, 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 it changed the dynamic in the street. And, of course, there were lots of people walking in the street, masked up, of course. Um, but it, it really felt like um, it, it was about being in the moment and fostering that kind of connection and inclusion. So just, as, uh, just before we finish, I'd like to share with you that um, I've actually writ written a novel. In fact, I started writing a novel in 2016 and it was about a woman who, you know, quite unexpectedly becomes prime minister. And she's advised in her, her prime ministership by a whole series of advisors, but particularly by a chicken, uh, a chicken called Ginger, who becomes her life coach and advises her on how to live with equanimity and openness to what life offers. And I think it's a, it's a, pretty, good, um, it's a pretty good metaphor, it's a pretty good set of advice for us to be proceeding on. Now, I need to also share with you that I've had multiple rejections for that novel. So if there's any publishers out there who are <laughs> keen to publish a novel about um, a female prime minister, please contact me, I, I, I'd welcome it. Um, but in the meantime, I thank you all for attending tonight. Uh, I'll hand over to Ian and uh, look forward to some questions. Thank you. That's terrific, Amanda. I, I guess I'm well alone and wondering what the title of the novel is. Uh, it's called The World According to Ginger. She's, hmm. she's the chicken. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I gathered that. Yeah, I, d I did have another uh, title, which was 
hens in for a prime minister, but that got ditched by, um, by one of the people who looked at it. Terrific. Well, Amanda, unsurprisingly, uh, your wide ranging remarks, and if I may so, say so, well, certainly thought provoking, but also touching in various ways, as is characteristic of you, uh, have stimulated some responses. And I'd like to go to the one that's got the most votes for the moment, and that's come from Mary Clare. And uh, Mary says this, uh, comparing Jacinda Ardern's approach to other traditional leadership approaches, is there a downside to appearing vulnerable or more relatable? Question mark. In a time of crisis, do we need to look for strength and decisiveness? That is, more traditional styles of leadership. And there were seven others who, who backed up Mary Claire's question. Why don't we go there first? Mm. Yes, thanks, Mary Claire. And uh, it's, it's a great question and a fascinating one. And look, I, I don't think there's a simple answer to it. Uh, but let me, let me come at it from a number of different angles. There's a lot of research about crisis management and... It is the case that in some crises, we need decisiveness and centralised control. But there's also some evidence that, uh, you know, that can come at a cost sometimes. Because what it can sometimes do, if you have a, if somebody who steps up and looks like they absolutely know what they're doing, that what happens is it can disempower others. It can also mean that, uh, People sort of abdicate and say, oh, okay, he or she knows what, you know, knows what we must do. Uh, we'll just follow. When in fact, crises often require a lot of stepping up and a lot of leadership more broadly. So there's some, some very interesting and conflicting uh, sort of findings from the research about what we need in crisis. And, um, you know, although the old military model was that notion of, you know, somebody knows the way, lead from the front. The evidence is, is much more nuanced than that and that there are certainly some sorts of crises when we actually want to call people to step up rather than just give up power to the person in charge. Um, yeah, so a very fascinating, uh, a, a very fascinating question. And, and I, I I do think some level of vulnerability is often very, very powerful in leaders. Even those, I mean, I think of, of the general who's now in charge of rolling out, um, you know, vaccinations in, in Australia. And, oh gosh, I feel for him, you know, what a job. Uh, so some vulnerability might be welcome there. Terrific. Next question from uh, Rob McGoran. Uh, in fact, Rob asked the question I was going to ask you. Know, I'm unsurprised he used to ask these questions in my class too. So, <laughs> so here we go from Rob. Uh, it would be interesting to hear from Amanda about where she can point to companies that are successfully building culture through a largely virtual framework. And in particular, how this can be developed and nurtured. Yeah, what about culture when people are all online? Mm. Yeah, another great question. And look, I've had the benefit. My um, my son has actually recently joined at Lassian. Um, he's actually in London at the moment, um, and uh, his partner has uh, got a job in London uh, with Slack. So um, I've I've been watching some of the tech firms for quite some time, and you know since really even just as COVID was starting to, um, you know, to, to, to move into our lives and to impact. And look, I think they do give us the, you know, the best examples of organisations who've really been on the front foot with realising that they, they just had to go completely remote working uh, so quickly. They had to really put a lot of effort into onboarding so um, my daughter-in-law who works for Slack has never met, she's been working with them for, I think close to uh, 16 months. She's never met in person any of her colleagues, but she's enormously attached to the organization. So it's, it's been very, very uh, interesting to watch the effort some of those companies have gone to in terms of 
onboarding, all sorts of ways of helping people feel connected, uh, feel as though they're part of the organisation, wherever they are working for and whatever time zones they are working for. Um, and, you know, I do think that they provide us with some extraordinary models for that. Yeah. Here's another student of both of ours, Selwyn D'Souza. Good to see you here, Selwyn. Um, Selwyn's asked, that it's, a, it's a sort of related question, but I think that there's enough difference for us to go with this, and it's always also been supported here by others. So someone asks, informal leadership, along with uh, casual people engagement, has largely disappeared in the virtual world. You know, the coffee conversations, water cooler, problem solving sessions, mentorship, uh, virtually, um, pardon the pun, non-existent. How can leaders bring this important part of culture stroke engagement back into focus? So I think it is doing a whole range of new and different things. I, I know myself that sometimes at the start of some meetings or at the end of some meetings, you know, there'll be a couple of people left and you know i often seize the opportunity to say look how are you traveling you know have you got a minute can we stay on <laughs> online so i think it is about leaders being very very um sensitive to opportunities like that and to encourage uh you know their other managers and team leaders to not see that as um to see that as essential you know those those extra means of checking in um and and also the fun ones um you know the ones that aren't as focused on getting through the task uh just the ones that how you how you're traveling uh those kinds of conversations i i do think we need to work harder at thinking about how to um how to offer those the virtual walks you know i can't tell you how many people I, um, I see on, on my walks um, having those check-ins as they walk. <laughs> and they, again, they, they, might be, they might be virtual, but they sound uh, meaningful. They sound uh, like they're sufficiently intimate and close to provide real support. Um, and innovation, you know, one of the other things that we used to coming together for is innovation and, and, and a lot of creativity. And I think there has been quite some, uh, you know, quite some great ways of doing this in a virtual world. And our, our own MBS test kitchens were a fantastic example of that, how you sponsor creativity that way. Terrific. This will be uh, the last one, uh, Amanda. And when you've done, uh, I'll ask Karan if she'd come on and close us up for this evening. Uh, and invite people to stay on for the meditation session. But this question comes from Camille Heimer. Uh, I'd wondered about this too, and uh, many others have supported her question. Camille asks, how do we ensure that the quiet achievers working remote are not left out? <laughs> wow, that's such an important question. I'm taking a while to to think about it. Uh, I, I think it's such an important question and, and it's a great one just to ask ourselves, how do we do it? it I, I spend a lot of time thinking about that in, in many of my classes where I know there's fantastic value sitting there and people are being quiet. I, I, I invite, I find ways of uh, supporting and appreciating and um, making space. And I'm sure you all do too. I, I think it's a, a fantastic prompt for us all to, you know, it's, it's what we all need, of course. You know, it, it's, that, it's that simple, that, that it, it doesn't have to be much. It's such a simple gift or act to say, look, I'd really love to hear what you, what you think about that. And I so appreciated you you know, you're being part of the group for that. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to do and, and a great reminder for us all to, uh, to do so. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks so much, Amanda. Karam.
Hello, and <laughs> Amanda, I was having trouble finding that mute button, unmute button. Can you believe it? Well, I'm really sorry to have to draw this evening to a close, Amanda, as we knew it would be um, inspired and inspiring from you. And I can just see in the outpouring that we've got in the chat how appreciated uh, it has been by our enormous audience. So thank you, Amanda. And I'm now going to remind our audience that um, in true Amanda style, we have the opportunity and the privilege to join her in a short meditation. So I'll, I'll let you take us through that, Amanda. And thank you again. Thank you, Karan, and, and thanks everyone. Uh, thank you to the, those of you who, who have to leave us. But, uh, you know, let's, let's just take a few moments. Those of you who can stay with us just for a few moments more. And I'm going to invite you to, uh, I'll take off my glasses, by all means do the same. Just make yourselves a little bit more comfortable right now. If it's easy and feels okay for you, you can lower the gaze or close the eyes. And as we sit for these few moments, just notice where there's some tightness or tension in your body and there will be some. And particularly as you exhale, see if you can let go of some of that tension or tightness. It might be in your shoulders, it might be around your jaw, around the teeth, the tongue. It might be behind the eyes or across the temples. Exhaling and letting some of that tightness go, that tension go. And taking your focus now to the breath. And we're not aiming to change the breath at all. Just noticing that subtle, cool sense of the breath as it travels in through the nose. And on the out breath, slightly warmer. And as we're sitting together for these few moments, all sorts of thoughts might have popped into your head. And that's absolutely fine. That's what happens. That's what our minds do. And they might be thoughts like, oh, I don't know about this, or I'm not very good at this, or I can't do this. And they are just thoughts. Just allow them to be there and allow them to go when they're ready. And just inviting in the body a sense of as much deep, natural ease as is possible for you right now. Letting go, letting go. Nothing you need to think about, nothing you need to do, just for these few moments. Now taking a slightly deeper breath into the belly, And as you do, take a moment to notice that sense of aliveness that comes from breathing consciously. Savoring this moment, this evening, this Tuesday, with this lovely group of people here. And then when you're ready, you might like to wriggle a little you might like to lift the shoulders or whatever feels good. 
Thank you everyone for staying with me. Please do go well. All the very best. Bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.